and a very warm welcome to everybody who's here today, um, both in the virtual room, which we have, but also um, who may be watching on Facebook or may be catching up afterwards. I know we've got 61 people who've said they want to be part of this, um, and hopefully our reach will be greater on such an important issue for all of us and our communities. Um, I won't say very much about myself, but I'm non-aligned politically, so I'm going to be listening very intently to what people have to say. Um, I'm also going to be um, channeling Jackie Weaver and being quite a stern chair here because we've got a lot of participants. Um, we've got three um, candidates standing for election who will be responding to each question. And um, so I'd like to fit as many questions in as possible. When you have questions, it really helped me if you could put them in the chat in brief um, and say uh, which area they relate to. And that will help me group um, questions together so that the candidate can answer once, say for a question about transport or um, sustainability or whatever. Um, that would be great. Um, what else do I have to say? We did, of course, invite the Labour Party as well to send a representative. Um, we approached the agent and various individuals. I got a um, polite reply from the leader of the council saying um, she and others were um, committed to another event. And if people wish to find out their um, policies, their manifesto is available on their website. So if you want to find out more, that's the place to look. Um, but I am absolutely delighted to have three candidates with us. I know it's a really busy time for you. You could be out knocking on doors and getting people's promises. So we uh, very much welcome your time here. It's a difficult job standing for election or being in an elected position. And I salute you for doing it. So you don't often get praise. You get less, lots of brickbats. So thank you. Um, I'm going to go through, we agreed in advance, we'll go through in alphabetical order by first name name um, for people from each party to have a three minute brief introduction to their party's policy on the environment. I've got a timer here so if it works I'm going to warn people just before they get to their three minutes so they can wind up. Um, so I'm going to invite Charith to be our first presenter for um, the Green Party. Thank you. Um, thank you very much um, Jenny for the invitation. Um, I would first like to thank NCAF for all the detailed work uh, that's being undertaken on behalf of um, Enfield residents. Bringing together over 120 organizations has been no mean feat, but an essential step certainly to tackle the climate change locally. Um, I certainly believe that the collaboration with civil society experts helps us all choose ways to confront, tackle and adapt to the climate emergency. There are many residents who have asked me uh, who want the London Borough of Enfield to respond effectively to the climate crisis. They want to involve the whole community to monitor feedback to and work with the local authority. And I think NCAP has been an excellent platform for that whole request. As a result of this collaboration, the NCAP pledges has come together very well, in my opinion, and covers crucial issues facing the borough today. Um, it is important we focus on what actually works and that we elect councillors who are prepared to go through the hard grind. Uh, we do not need councillors, in my opinion, who use the climate crisis as a political football. There should be absolutely no room for greenwashing. Uh, we, certainly in my role as a uh, councillor, I have therefore been driving for evidence-based decision-making. I have used one of the main tools available to opposition members, that is the scrutiny process, to hold our local decision makers to account. Um, I certainly have authored scrutiny reports such as the Meridian Water Environmental Strategy. Um, I have called in decisions on quiet enables into scrutiny to explore the available evidence more closely. I have called an extraordinary council meeting to debate the lack of an independent impact assessment of the expanded Edmonton incinerator on people of Enfield and the environment. So I basically pledge to support uh, to the issues raised in the Enfield manifesto, cutting waste, the car use, sustainable assets, 
cutting pollution, the land use issues, mitigating flood risks, uh, needing for more education and improving public health. So I basically would like to remind residents that the Green Party is not just about climate related issues. We are about handling the climate crisis that is built on a foundation of social justice. We certainly and firmly believe that more of the burden of the transition to a green up economy should not be carried by those who are most socially economically disadvantaged. So I'm here certainly to answer questions in the best way I can, or even later if anyone wants to me email me directly. Um, so thank you very much, Jenny, for that. Thank you, Charis. And actually, you were under your time. So thank you for helping us out with that. I'm now going to invite Ertan to give us his brief introductory remarks. Uh, thank, thank you, Jenny. And uh, can I echo what Charith said, that in many ways the uh, climate crisis does transcend party politics. And despite some of our differences, we do have many common goals. And that is to, to save the planet for our future generations. And I think where we vary sometimes is how we achieve that ultimate goal. Um, but um, obviously we have the national side and we have the local side. And, and I think tonight we, we, wish, we do wish to focus on the local side. And like Charith, our party um, seeks an, an, uh, a pause on the new Edmonton incinerator. We want more evidence on that. Uh, when I was previously a councillor, um, you know, our party opposed it. And one of the reasons we opposed it was uh, simply because of the sheer volume of extra lorries that would have to uh, travel along the A406, which, as we know, is already congested, and the increased pollution that would uh, cause for all the local residents. So we are urgently seeking a cause on the expansion of the incinerator. And also the local party seeks to plant more trees, uh, something which... Uh, this council has failed to do. They have planted more, but, but certainly not enough. Bring in more electric charging points, increase the rate of recycling. We're one of the worst in London at the moment. Enlarge the council's electric vehicle fleet. Again, instead of in, investing in uh, polluting vehicles, we want to change the policy there. Um, we're looking for outside funding to help council properties uh, improve their insulation and reduce the CO2 emissions, uh, because I, I'm sure most people here know, but uh, perhaps the ordinary people not involved in these issues don't realise that houses, our own houses, are one of the biggest polluters um, in the country. I think they're second or third after vehicles. So it's really important that we do insulate both for the pocket and for the environment. So we as a party, you know, uh, also want to protect the green belt. Um, I know Labour aren't here to defend themselves, but very recently their local plan was to build 6,000 plus houses on our green belt. Now they are the, the, they are the borough's lungs. Uh, and I'm sure the, uh, the other colleagues here tonight do not want to see any building on the green belt. We, we want to stop that. Um, we also want the, the Labour Party to review its plan on building on, uh, for example, uh, Winchmore Hill Sainsbury's car parks. Um, uh, uh, Tan, sorry, can I ask you to draw your remarks to a close? Yes, sorry, sorry. Um, we also want to bring back weekly refuse and recycling because, again, our recycling rates are woefully low. I think by bringing in re uh, weekly recycling collections, that will improve it. Um, we also, um, with government assistance, want to run a completely free bulky collection service. Now, I know um, that is being possibly reintroduced, um, but we want to put that in cement, so to speak. Uh, we also want to remove um, appointments that are currently necessary to go and uh, uh, attend Barrow Green Recycling. Um, we want to plant, as I said earlier, three at least 3,000 trees. So I mean, we have a lot of things to do, and we do have our manifesto as well available online. Um, but it's also, I think, incumbent on us as individuals to see what we're doing as well. And I think just from a personal uh, perspective, and I've read NCAF's manifesto, is I 
did a big rebuild on my office here. And I insisted that each and every brick that was taken down from the building was used in the reconstruction. So outwardly, even though we've expanded the size of the building, we've used all the original bricks. And that's something I think the council can take a lead on, particularly in planning, to say, what are you going to do to recycle if you are demolishing where, demo where people decide to demolish? I've also installed um, EV chargers. I want to install one more, but I've been told that if I want to upgrade my electrical system to the office, I've got to pay the council close to £4,000 for a traffic order. Now, that's putting me off as a businessman. Um, to, to put a charge, another charging point, because my the, the supply can only take one. Um, um, I think I'm going to have to stop yeah. you, uh, Ten. Thank you. Right. Thank you very much indeed. I've managed to squeeze quite a lot into that. Okay. <laughs> well, thank you, Rob. Over to you for your introductory remarks. Hello, I'm Rob Wilson from Enfield Liberal Democrats. The joys of having a name that begins with W or R, depending on how you do it, always means you go last. So, uh, wow, all the policies I was about to say have already been said. But even if they hadn't, this would be the part where I guess I should tell you that our, our policies are unique and they are different and they are radical. And um, I think you're going to hear a lot of us agree really on a lot of stuff tonight. Uh, I don't think anything is particularly different we will agree with the greens or conservatives or labor and vice versa and all the way around um so what's the point of us uh our usp what is it i mean yeah we could spice it up with saying we, we all, all the parties did something 20 years ago i don't suggest we go down that let's focus on the future um but we are an evidence rules-based party sometimes the answer it, that is the right answer for the environment can be a slightly counterintuitive um we want a war on pollution uh, not personal mobility. And uh, we don't know everything. Uh, so we talk to people that do know things. Uh, we have not had enough of experts. This doesn't mean some wishy-washy answer where we just talk and talk and talk and talk and talk. It just means that we talk to the right people and that includes our constituents. And then we come to a decision. You're not going to please everybody all the time, but you can come up with something that people get what they want and the people who don't want it can live with it. We seem to have forgotten uh, how to do politics at the moment locally, I believe. You know, no one lives their life the same way as we do politics. If you went to the doctor with a leg issue and before they sat down, they said, well, we're going to have to take it off. Uh, you would think they were crazy, but that seems to be the way that we want our council run or certain parts of it. We have things like traffic schemes. I have no doubt we'll talk about it tonight, but they are traffic schemes. They are not culture wars. Nobody has lost their borough and has to get it back. We really need to sort of be a lot more evidence-based. If things work, they stay in. If they don't work, they get taken out. It seems fairly simple, yet I think for, okay, wow, we, we've gone straight to the EU question. Maybe we'll get to that later. Um, we seem to make a lot of sim simple things very, very complex. Sorry, there's a question that popped up at the bottom. But that's our USP. If stuff works, we do it. We talk to people, we get the best decision that we can for the most amount of people. And that's our USP. And it's uh, no dogmatism. I look forward to your questions. All right, thank you. You're within your time as well. <laughs> well done. Um, I'm looking at the questions and I'm seeing some themes emerge. We're clearly going to have a, a section on transport. Um, so don't worry if you've got questions on that and one on emissions and waste. Um, I've got one question on um, mental health and essentially public health, which is a, a, one of the areas we have in the manifesto. So if you've got other questions on that, please drop them in the chat. I'm going to seize the chair's prerogative to ask the first question of each of the candidates. And uh, perhaps I'll take the questions the answers in the opposite order to the contributions. And that's if you were elected and you achieved one thing um, for the environment in your term as councillor, what would you want that to be? So I'll start with Rob. Who wasn't ready on his unmute button, sorry. Um, one thing, uh, honestly, I don't think there's one particular single thing what I think we should do is have uh, some sort of committee-based um, 
approach the environment where we can't every four years keep swapping and changing you know we're going to rip this in we're going to rip this out to have more of a long-term plan for that you've got to involve all the parties including the minority ones um but that that would be the best thing i think that we can do is that okay. at the moment we're having you know we're going to do this oh we're not going to do this and the climate doesn't work that way all right thanks rob um Ertan. Okay, um, can I say two things? <laughs> uh, one, one of them, they, they sort of been in, interrelate. One is the Edmonton incinerator. When I was, uh, when I was a councillor before, I was on the North London Waste Authority, and I can categorically say I am opposed to it. It would be a disaster for this area, a disaster for the poorest people in the borough, and a disaster for everyone who lives on the A406. I would be again, 100% against it. And the other thing, uh, expanding on what Rob said, is it's not just being local. We need cross-borough cooperation. It's no good having cycle lanes that stop at the A406, because once people get past there, it's, it, it gets back to the fear factor. So people might be confident to go on the cycle lanes in Enfield, but then they get into Harringay, and there are, there are very few cycle lanes that go up green lanes and everywhere else. So you, you've got people who might be confident to cycle parts of it, but they're not the whole journey, and that deters okay. them completely. Right, thank you. Charith? Um, Jenny, could you just ask that question again? Uh, if you were elected again and were to achieve one thing in your five years for the environment, what would you most want to do? Um, I think certainly... From my side, there are a lot of things uh, which could be achieved, but I think personally from an um, infield and the residence point of view, I think the focus for me should be the housing side. And because this, your question was related to environmental things, there's a lot we need to do in terms of reducing the, um, the energy losses through the housing. So the insulation is a very big part of it, but really uh, having uh, affordable like for, for the housing um, uh, for people who are not uh, economically um, have all the means themselves. So one of the key areas I think we should do is to combine the social need with the um, climate crisis issue. And I think housing would be something very important to go up. Right. Thank you very much. I think that gives us a sense of each of you as individuals and your own passions. Right, I'm going to come to um, the questions that I'm seeing in chat now. Um, I'd ask everybody to just introduce themselves by name. I know we've got somebody who's just down as voter. So if um, I come, the, your question at the moment, I think probably isn't for local candidates. Um, let's start with a series of questions about the Edmonton incinerator. Matt Byrne um, has put something in there. Matt, can, can we unmute Matt and ask him to ask his question? I don't see him <clears> on the screen, but I guess he's there. Oh, he can you hear me? Yes. Ask your question. Could he, uh, can I remind you to keep it as short as possible, please? Sure. Okay. Well, the latest uh, figures for the Edmonton incinerator show it's going to emit 700,000 tonnes uh, of CO2 annually, that will make it by far the biggest polluter in the borough, far outweighing um, cars and almost anything else. It is an extraordinary level of pollution. And I'd like to just for the uh, candidates to be clear about uh, whether they're for it or against it. And it sounds like we've heard part of that already. And indeed what they think some of the solutions might be other okay. than burning it. Okay, I'm going to start with Ertan, who I know where you stand on the general principle, as you've told us, but uh, what about solutions? Okay, um, I mean, I'm sure most of you know the Edmonton incinerator is not for Enfield, it's for the whole London, North London, so we'll be taking in waste from, uh, from Haringey, Barnet, all, all across, this is why it's not just the incinerator itself, it's the lorries, it's the incessant traffic. And, and as you quite rightly said, I do, I do oppose it and have opposed it. Um, alternatives, um, well, we don't want to go back to landfill. We want to recycle, we want to improve recycling. You know, we have to improve it. We are woefully low. 
our targets are low. We've gone to twice weekly collections. We need to get back to uh, weekly collections. Um, go to the you know the three R's: recycle, reuse, replenish. You know, we just have to constantly look at new ways of reusing what we do. Uh, and and again, if I can just refer back to businesses, because I am my business is actually in Palmer's Green. I pay extra for my paper waste to be taken by the local council. So whereas domestically you you get it done free in effect through the council tax, I pay business rates, but I have to pay extra, and I do that voluntarily. I don't have to. How many businesses don't do that? And how many businesses put it in the waste so it gets incinerated? So there are things we can do to improve recycling. We're just at the tip of the iceberg. There's a Thank lot. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, Rob, let me ask you, um, wh where do you stand on the incinerator and what solutions would you suggest? Uh, the incinerator, uh, look, if we were saying that we were going to um, build a coal-fired uh, energy plant in Edmonton or Winchmore Hill, we'd be dead against it straight away. Uh, it's about the same level of pollution, so we should really call out for what it is. Um, you can't take down recycling overnight. We'd probably have to life extend the one we've got. That means that you would buy yourself time, but you haven't spent a load of money on it, so you don't have to make the money back. Um, there's no one nice answer. You can do uh, waste recovery like oil and solvents. You can do compost biodegradable waste, anaerobic digestion. There's something interesting called plasma arc gasification. But there's no magic answer. But I think what we've got to do is long term move away from single use plastics. The fact that we call them recyclable, it's like calling cigarettes Marlboro lights. They're still what they are. Um, but in that time, we've got to buy time by life extending what we've got, because then we haven't spent X amount of million quid and have to pay it back. We can just burn it when we absolutely need to. And you get it down over time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes, I, single use plastics I've been pulling out of the lakes in the parks for the last year. It's my pet hate. Um, Charith. Yeah, I, mean, um, I think anyone who heard uh, my um, speech at the, um, the, the debate in the council uh, knows that my position that it should not go ahead with the information which we have at present. Mm -hmm. the, one of the biggest issues which we have is that uh, it, NPL Council has not done an independent um, impact assessment of the incinerator on NPL. We are relying on the Northwest London Waste Authority data and their reports, but it's located in our borough, and we really should have done um, a specific um, impact assessment on its impact on local people and our environment right here. And now, there are some things which are really also worrying in the scheme, why, and that's the reason why I'm against it. Um, it, it really, they haven't costed the uh, carbon capture and storage part of the thing. The new regulations say that it is an essential part of the technology which has to have going over a period of time. And at the moment, there's no um, transparency on the cost of that part of it. So it could be that the NPL Council could be facing a lot more cost on that as well. Um, but on a, on a wider issue, uh, again, putting a lot of these burdens on the council also is not right. And I feel that at a national level, we do not treat, uh, from a regulatory point of view, we do not have enough pressures on the people who are producing this, like the big manufacturers are using non-recyclable plastic. They call it plastic bottles, but they are multi-layer bottles. So you have PET, PVCs, all the labels and everything mixed in together. And sometimes there is very little, it's very difficult to um, separate those out. But certainly there are a lot of technologies um, like laser-based optical sorting systems where we could be using right now, um, certainly in the Edmonton um, recycling facility to uh, recover a lot of the um, recyclable material that's getting burned today. All right. So Thanks. I think one of the, the whole scheme there is such that we could do a lot more, but, and I'm personally quite against how it's done right now. All right, thank you, Charith. Um, I'm going to switch us to another topic, um, and uh, particularly because NCAF is um, now involved in 
doing some work on public health and encouraging discussion. I'm going to invite Rupert to ask his question, which Thanks, is about um, climate change. Thank you. Um, so locally and nationally, we have a mental health crisis, which has been totally aggravated by the pandemic. How do the candidates feel the climate emergency relates to this mental health emergency? I'm going to ask Ertan first to respond. I, um, over the years, I've changed quite a lot from someone who was uh, probably quite right wing to someone who's more centre. And um, having grandchildren changes things even more. And you, I think once you do have grandchildren, those of us who are grandparents, you understand the cycle of life uh, more, you understand how important the future is. And I think mental health has had a disproportionate impact on our younger generation. And I will work extremely hard to put as much resources as possible into helping particularly the young people overcome that. They have enough stress in life with whether or not um, we can affect cl the, the climate, control it, whether or not they're going to get a job after college, uh, whether or not they'll be able to pay their student loans. And I actually do feel for the young generation, I think we should give them all the help we can. Thank you. Uh, Charith, I come to you. I mean, the, the mental health issues are quite wide ranging. Um, um, the climate issue is one of things, but uh, on a real basis, I think when people are struggling right now in terms of um, the base, basic needs they are meeting with is housing, the, um, the, the debt crisis they are facing, the, um, the crimes that are around. So there are many issues that affect people. And I think without having a really good program to look after the well-being of people right across society and um, underfunding public services, it's, it causes a lot more um, um, mental health issues across the, uh, across the residents in the borough. So yes, absolutely, there, there definitely is an impact with the climate issues on the longer term, but people are facing real crisis right now on their day-to-day -day living. And I think that is also making a big, big contribution to the mental health issues people are facing. So that's something which we can't lose sight of. Thank you. Uh, over to you, Rob. I think there's two things. Uh, you've got the worry and the actual effect of something happening. I mean, when I was growing up, it was the four minute warning. And, um, you know, if you've ever watched Threads on BBC, mm. that was, you know, but that's the equivalent they're having now. Um, and I think also you have the effect uh, that if you get flooded or you have the actual things that happen, then that will affect your mental health as well. Now, I guess. How do you change that or at least help with that? I think some of it starts with empowerment that people, you know, if you feel useless, that can give you, you know, or that you can't change stuff, then that will cut, you know, that's not going to help your mental health. If you are empowered to at least do something small, do something to actually change the, you know, where we're going with it, if they can improve matters and they can improve their mental health as well. Yeah. Um, there's no one size fits all, I think, with mental health. But I think, you know, if you could take away, if you give people some sense of empowerment, then that might help. Thank you very much. Now, there's a whole series of questions about transport, which clearly has been quite a controversial local issue in many ways. I think what I'm going to do is to sort of group them together because people have asked about cycle use, about public transport and about LTNs. So um, I think actually Michael, oh, that, that was specifically about commuter vehicles traveling through the borough. So I'm gonna ask each of the candidates to tell us um, how you see um, it being possible to reduce um, tra traffic through the borough and to move people away from private cars um, into more energy friendly uh, transport, including feet. That's, that was feel pedestrians get left out of this. Um, so I will start with you, Rob. Okay. This almost feels like the um, how do you lose weight question. 
We all know what the answer is. <laughs> You've got to have more work, people walking. You've got to use cars less. But I think, you know, we've got to get over what is the main problem is that most people want other people to drive less. But they should, they do need their four by four Land Rover. <laughs> you know, it is a, it almost might be a generational thing, but you know, you've got to have cycle lanes, you've got to have park and ride, you've got to have public transport. There is no magical answer. We know what the answer is, yet we still get in our car to drop the kids 50 metres to school. That's the answer. We know what the answer is. Now, if, uh, if there's something around, particularly around commuter vehicles, I think you could do something where I think a lot of traffic in Enfield is generated by people coming from the M25 to the A10. Um, you could do something further out like that, like some sort of ring road or something, but then you're just moving a problem. But we know what the answer is. We just got to start walking more. You got to catch the bus. Uh, there are schemes that means that, that makes that more attractive. Um, there is an interesting thing that they did in Luxembourg of making public transport free. That would make a big difference. But we all know what the answer is. It's, it's but it's our behaviour that will drive it. And there's only met so many carrot and sticks that you can have. The LTNs are one hell of a stick. And then we all went to war on each other and we've got a culture war on our hands. Um, not a great answer, I'm afraid, but I, I do think that that's what true. We know what the answer is. One of the direct questions that's come in on transport is about reducing the speed limit to 20 miles an hour on residential roads. And um, uh, uh, that was from Anne asking if... Um, that's something you'd support or even on main roads? Uh, okay, so yeah, we do have a policy. And again, this might be one of these counterintuitive things that anybody's driving a car, so well, I must drive at 40 miles an hour. You don't drive at 40 miles an hour around Enfield. <laughs> You'd be lucky to get to 20 most of the time. Mm -hmm. um, it, but it might actually help a lot with pollution. Um, where you on the motorways, you know, when you have the smart motorways and you think, why are we going to 50? This doesn't make any sense. I'm going to get there slower. Then you start moving a lot quicker. Um, if you, there is a thing that you can say, if you, pure car journeys that went past that point in an hour is not reliable to pollution. If they're stuck in a traffic jam, you get the opposite thing. You okay. don't really take down pollution, but yes, we do support a lot more road right. 20 miles an hour. Thanks, Rob. Um, coming to Charith, um, your general thoughts on reducing traffic and perhaps a specific answer on that point. Yeah. Um, so I mean, what is traffic? Traffic is really the, it's about the efficient movement of people and goods in a way that enhances the well-being of the local community, right? And has a positive impact on the um, environment and the economy. So tra traffic cannot be considered in isolation. And that's one of the things that is happening. We need to have uh, an integrated fair green port transport strategy, right? And if we just try to do little disconnected odd bits and pieces in a borough, that doesn't quite work. We have to work with other boroughs. We have to work at national levels. And a lot of this really has to be coming down from central government downwards to really help and uh, enable really uh, to handle this critical crisis uh, very seriously. One of the issues which is happening right now people all agree that we have to do something. And by doing it in a very disjointed way, uh, people are uh, causing a lot of problems, more problems sometimes than it's trying to solve. Um, and that's why I keep saying that we have to be really ruthless about the evidence, completely, and feel free to challenge that because these are things that are very complex problems and not really be worried about being called out for, um, uh, call out IO in one camp or the other. We have to have uh, solutions that are working. Uh, we cannot solve problems without understanding them properly. For example, how many people drive through a borough and why? Right? Uh, how many people, what is the transport patterns of the poorest and people in the society? Right? So we have to understand how are they earning money? Have they got space to park cycles on fourth floor of their flats, right? Can they afford, if you're a family of four, can you have four bicycles in an overcrowded flat? And Enfield is full of overcrowded residents, right? So the issue which Thank I you, keep trying to push is where is the evidence? Get the evidence. And that's why I was fighting for a 
equalities impact assessment. We really need to take this thing seriously and not just do greenwashing, throw here, a, throw All random right. solutions at this complex problem. Thank you, Charis. Sorry to draw you to conclusion. I want to get plenty of questions in. Um, Ertan, your, your turn on this. If I can obviously address the issue separately. Um, in terms of the, uh, the, the, tr the traffic, um, emissions from private vehicles have actually gone, gone down because vehicles are more efficient. But at the same time, because there are more delivery vans and people having deliveries to their homes, there are more vans and lorries on our roads. So as Charis sort of touched upon, we need to understand the nature of what's going on in the borough. It's changed over the last 10 to 15 years. So the, the composition of what the roads are for, what they're used for and the vehicles on those roads has changed. And we also need to, to get the statistics as to who's driving through the borough, who's driving within the borough and who's coming to the borough and parking and where they're parking or where they're using their vehicles. Um, at the moment, I, I don't know the answer to, to any of those questions because I don't think a, a comprehensive study has been done. And then if that's done here, it should be perhaps done across London so we can all talk to each other and see what the solutions are. But what isn't a solution is to build on Cockfosters Car Park, for example, because all you're doing is you're going to displace the vehicles for people who would ordinarily drive there and take a train into London. You're not quite sure what the impact of that is without doing a study first. Just building on it is not, is not the answer. 20 mile per hour, 100% on side residential roads. I think it should be done. 30 is too fast now. Um, vehicles, just like many other things on the roads, not just uh, motor cars, are killing machines. So someone doing 30 and hitting a child, God forbid, at 30 miles an hour it is horrendous. Yes, 20 mile an hour on side roads, yes. On the main roads, I'm not so sure. Um, I, I need to be persuaded on that, uh, whether we go from 30 to 20. Um, I've been across London at 20 mile an hour and it, 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 it just adds to the traffic. So I'm not, not quite sure. I, I, I need to be persuaded on that. OK, good to have some party distinctions here. We've been at risk of breaking out into a degree of consensus and those that are represented anyway, like a bit of debate at election time. Um, Cathy Donegan has asked us a related question. Is Cathy there and can we unmute her? The first part of your um, question, particularly Cathy, on what we do. On, this is on air pollution. Richard, I, I've asked so many questions. The, the main question I had was how familiar are the candidates with the Climate Action Plan, which has been issued, and how, uh, what, what do they think about the progress which is being made against the targets set in that Climate Action Plan, um, on the assumption that the plan is adequate in the first place, uh, which I would welcome their view on. OK, I thought you were going to ask another one, but I, I, Sorry. I might ask that one for you. OK, okay. Uh, let me ask. Well, actually, if I could add, I will add your second question to that. I think it relates. Um, Kathy was asking what happens when we breach air pollution standards? And actually, um, it's not been publicised yet, but I was out with Aurora and others um, measuring um, the small particles outside our schools in the borough and they were way uh, the, okay there were one-off measurements but they're way above the um, standard that's been set by the World Health Organization for air pollution in um, urban areas and uh, real cause for concern so what do we do about that um, so how do we think the current plans going is it good enough and what do we do if um, things are clearly going askew in our local area I'm going to start with uh, Charis on that one yeah um, I'm just trying to pick that question up yeah I mean I'll start with the climate action plan one which um, Cathy mentioned um, certainly at the time of the time it was published uh, we, we raised the issues that it was a very aspirational document and didn't have adequate um, targets um, in terms of really challenging targets to meet the, 
media, media challenges. And as part of the environmental scrutiny panel, that's something which we really push to get some answers on. And unfortunately for the lack of uh, the issues with the, the whole scrutiny process, um, I certainly didn't get the adequate answers I was looking for. So uh, there are some good points in that, right? Um, a good aspirations, but this is a, a climate crisis we are facing. So we really need to have some really serious, measurable, like smart objectives, which are very specific, measurable, achievable, and time bound, right? And, and realistic. So they are very important that we have that. And certainly the action plan, I didn't think had enough of that. So it's very difficult to track it in, a, in the details it needs to be done. Um, okay, and on the, what do we do about high levels of air pollution uh, um, when it breaches international standards? I mean, the, 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 we have to tackle that stuff. So right now, if you look at some of the, the measurements of the pollution levels, we don't really have adequate uh, monitoring of the air pollution in key areas. Um, I, I happen to be in Southgate Ward and to try and get the right levels of air pollution. Certainly we have a very busy uh, junction called the, at the Southgate surface, right? Very, very busy to get some really detailed uh, uh, insights of the um, pollution there, it's qu quite difficult. We have been given some numbers, but to do, do it in the, the way we need to track. And I think when the overall air pollution numbers are reducing outside London because of the vehicles improving uh, the technological wise, uh, we have sort of stagnant um, levels of um, pollution now. So we, we are seeing pollution right now at this level. And I think if you don't measure it, you can't address the problem. So certainly okay. we really need to do a lot more in terms of monitoring it. And, uh, but I think one of the things that's also important is it really needs to be funded. And these things can, are very difficult to do just within the council. And I think a lot of this is to do with the national funding formulas where the council is really pressurized. We have huge amounts of funding cuts. So even while we are sitting in the council, uh, it's nice to promise type stuff, but when there's a choices between real people, adult social care, children services, uh, and you have to make some choices, it's very difficult to do. And I think unless nationally we take the issue of climate crisis very seriously and fund it, um, it's um, a huge thing for the councils to um, pick up. So I'm okay. not letting the council off the hook, but I'm certainly saying that at the national level, we certainly have to take this much more seriously. It may, thank you. I was going to say that there, there are some models in other countries of citizens monitoring levels, and I think there, are, there is some affordable equipment. Obviously, it'd be good to have that more official, but I think we can demonstrate the problem. Anyway. Just to one point on yeah. that. We had someone on a similar, with similar device in Southgate, but if they're not properly calibrated, Right, it's very yeah. difficult to rely on data which is done ad hoc. So it's important that we understand the devices and whether they are calibrated or not. Right, so you yeah. can actually. They need to be. Them. They need to be. I'm going to ask um, Ertan next. Okay, I mean again, I, I can agree to some uh, points with Charith that we do need more monitoring. From um, what my limited understanding is that. Um, where you tend to breach the standards, it's on TFL roads, which the council has limited um, a control over. So again, it's working with the authorities and saying, well, you know, if you are breaching it, what are you going to do about it? How can we work with TFL um, to ensure there's a free flow or restrict flows uh, when, when it appears there's breaching? And also more monitoring. I think we've all, we all agree on that. We We... If we can have more monitoring across the borough and observe traffic patterns, maybe we can determine which routes do need freeing up, which routes need diverting. Um, there's a lot, there is a lot to do, a lot we don't know. Um, and, and so we don't have the answers, unfortunately, because we, we don't have the data or the statistics. And in terms of the plan itself, um, like, like most politicians, and you know, I can put my hands up to that, we're very good at putting things in paper, but very bad at... Um, actions and uh, outcomes so yeah it, it appears okay on on paper but they've not achieved everything they set out to do uh not necessarily their fault it's uh, some things are beyond their control um 
well, they haven't achieved their recycling targets. They've not yet achieved the number of electronic vehicle um, charging stations. But uh, as I said, it, it, on paper, it's fine. But um, like many things, targets and what you achieve are two different things. Right. Thank you. Uh, moving to Rob. Okay, okay sure. Um, the Air Quality Action Plan. I've read it. It's a nice document. I mean, it's, it's only one firm commitment, and that's to achieve net zero for the council's own operations by 2030. That's only 2% of the pollution in the borough. It's like me publishing a document saying I want a perm. It what difference does it make? I mean, it's not bad, but I mean, anybody could have produced that. Um, you've got to stick to it. Um, it's very high on you know, fluffy loveliness and very low on action. Uh, as regards shutting roads, it feels a bit hammer to crack a nut, especially if you only do partial roads, because then they'll all just go down the other one. Uh, but there is, I think there's a different way of doing it. Um, to get yourself back underneath WHO levels, you, there's uh, Euro 5, Euro 6, Euro 4 vehicles on the road. Uh, you could ban non-compliant vehicles, a small, uh, and get back below WHO Levels quite quick. It's a bit unfair on people who have got these cars. So you need an element of phase out and maybe some buyback. We've done it before. Uh, if you got, you know, you could have a bit of a low hanging fruit quick win by taking the most polluting off and get below the levels very quickly. I, I'm going to be honest. I don't think unless you closed all of the roads, and that is an impressive ask. I don't. I don't think you'd actually. You just shift stuff. OK, thanks, Rob. Um, uh, there's been quite a lot of comments in the chat, which are quite informative about, and with suggestions as well. I just want to pull out for the people who don't have access to the chat, perhaps watching it on catch up that the council is now consulting on the air quality action plan up until the 3rd of May. There's more information on the council website. I know Vicky's told us that it's quite difficult to track down there. Um, but um, I guess now we know it's there, we can we can find it. I'm sure we'll put it on the NCAF um, website and Facebook um, group as well. So if people have got further comments, this is the time to feed it in. Slightly odd that it's happening during the PERDA time, but there we are. Maybe PERDA doesn't operate in the way I think it does. Um, I'm going to move us on to another topic now, because I think we've given transport and air pollution quite a good hearing here. And Zoe, I'm going to come to you and your question about education and young people. Thanks. Um, thanks, Jenny. Yeah, so I'm interested in education um, and I'm wondering what the candidates would do to try and get the climate emergency onto the national curriculum where it is woefully absent and get the climate emergency talked about and acted on in schools across the borough and not just secondary schools where I think it crops up once or twice, but in, in our primary schools as well. Um, so I'm going to come to Ertan. Uh, th thank you, Zoe. Um, I've been a count, uh, sorry, a, a governor of Highfield School for 20 years, which is, as you probably know, is a, is a primary school, and they are actually voluntarily quite active in uh, promoting the climate um, issue, but not in a worrying way to the to the young children, just so they can understand what the issues are and what the solutions are. So I don't think. Um, we want to worry our children at that age, um, but you're quite right. We do it voluntarily. Should it be on the national curriculum? Um, yes, as long as we're open for an honest debate. I don't agree with the, yeah, the, the climate deniers, but I think at the higher age groups, we should have an open debate. Um, and if we do put it on the curriculum, we should allow other points of view as well, whilst I don't agree with them. But certainly, yes, why not? OK, thank you. Um, coming to Rob. Um, I'm not sure, honestly, what, what we can do about getting on a national curriculum at a local level. Um, that's something, you know, go, go back to our own parties and talk about. I think at a local level, it's uh, getting um, local groups like NCAF involved in schools. You do have uh, volunteers going to school all the time. I don't think it's... You know, we don't want to scare the life out of them, but to show children the link between human activity and climate change, 
um, seems to be a very fair way of letting their own draw their own conclusions. Um, that's what I do. Right. Thank you, Rob. Charit. Um, I think that education is such an important thing. If you don't get the culture chain happening right now, um, I think like Zoe has pointed out, it's very difficult to continue this. Uh, so now one of the big issues is there's no point giving just education and then in the school canteen they stuff have single use plastics and all the type of uh, snacks we are getting which non recyclable material and stuff. And again, yes, in the local council and local areas, we can do a lot about it. But there has to be a really a commitment at a national level, not just from a curriculum point of view, but also showing that uh, the actions have to follow if you really believe that, right? So it's still there's no restrictions on the type of uh, material we are, we are using for all sorts of things, uh, for, for the packaging and things, excessive amount of packaging. Um, so I think it's a very critical thing that we have to do, try and do the education. But also in the schools, uh, we don't really have even the whole selection of different um, recycling uh, boxes and stuff. So certainly in any field, uh, even in some other countries, you have the, the different recycling for the types of metals or even at the different types of plastics in some of the European countries. So people know that uh, which can and can't be easily recycled. So it's an essential area which we um, need to bring up, but I think something which we can do locally, maybe for a group like NCAC, is to really try and engage uh, um, the schools much more and produce the right material, which then the schools can pick up themselves. But I think uh, I, I agree with you. So we really need to get it down to a, the curriculum, um, even at the primary level. Thank you, Charith. I know if, if we had right to reply here, Zoe would be talking about all the splendid work she and her group are doing to raise the issue with schools and long may that continue and may, may we in future be working more closely with the council on that. I want to move us on to another area. I've been checking the different areas of our manifesto that have already come up in questions and there's one about using land wisely and there was an, a, a question um, headlined earlier from Carol Fisk about the use, the appropriate use of green land. So Carol, are you there and can we unmute you and could you ask yes, your I'm question? Yes, I'm here. I'm here. Um, I'm part of the NCAF land use group with Vicky Pipe, Matt Byrne and some other people. Um, the candidates uh, may or may not be aware that there is no strategic plan for Northwest Enfield, which is where most of our green belt lies. And so our committee has been exploring um, what uses our countryside should be best put to. And, you know, should it be agriculture, which brings in food security? Should it be public access? Should it be planting more trees? Should it be rewilding and nature? Um, we have a wonderful resource there, but it's not just a sort of fuzzy feel good topic it's something that needs to be looked at because it impacts our lives in so many different ways and levels so um, if you were creating a strategic plan for the northwest of Enfield and the green belt what would your priorities be for its uses given that none of you want to build on it which is fabulous thank you okay. I'm going to ask Rob first for his response um I can tell you my personal preference, which I am a big fan of getting more insects around, so rewilding, but it's not for me to say. And you know what? It's not for a political party to say. It is for the people who understand what the best things to use it that situate that that land is for. If we say that we oh we should do all of this rewilding and then it turns out that it's a bog, then it's not going to work. Um, we should have a proper um, survey done and the people who know what they're talking about which is not us because we have some great ideas, but um, we've got to take a bit more of a bureaucrat stance on this. Um, personally, I like rewilding and I like uh, agriculture and all the nice fluffy stuff, but I'm not going to tell you how to use it because I don't know. Okay, that's a, a great response from a politician, I think, actually, and we don't hear it often enough, so thank you for that. Um, Charith, um, can I come to you? I mean, certainly to um, make parks fully accessible, safe and enjoyable is always a really good uh, target. I mean, there's a, a severance between the Edmonton and the Lee Valley Regional Park area. 
and the original Meridian Water Master Plan was to improve this, but somehow it seems to have now been forgotten, right? So certainly that needs to be looked at again. Um, also, we need new parks that are fit for purpose. Certainly in part of our uh, scrutiny work in the um, Meridian Water time, uh, projects, um, the proposed parks by the council at Meridian Water are far too small for the number of people who, are, who will be living there. And there is unused land, particularly nearby, that could be used to create a much larger park for the uh, people of Edmonton. So I think certainly in those type of areas, we are, we are completely dis, disjointed about the number of people and their current needs versus the park space and stuff available. So I think that's something which we really need to push really hard. Moving to Ertan, please. Like Rob, I'm, I'm not an expert, but um, I would listen. I mean, ultimately, we would have to make a decision as, as politicians, and I would listen to the experts to say this land is suitable for agriculture, for allotments, uh, even cemeteries can be uh, deemed suitable for uh, green belt use, whether we do them as a full cemetery or whether uh, it's something else. But um, I would take the experts view, but would certainly not build on them, but um, make the decision based on what we're advised, whether it's rewilding, whether it's agriculture, because not all soil is suitable for agriculture, or if it's how long it would take to reinstate it. Um, so, um, but you know, we are one of the greenest boroughs in, in London. And what I do object to is the large developers buying it out cheap, holding on for it, because they, they take the long-term view. They can hold on to these, this land for 30, 40 odd years, wait for governments to change, wait for policies to change. And I just hope you know, we can have a cross-party cross agreement at some stage where that sort of um, uh, policy taken by these companies is outlawed, where it's, it's not held by these large companies with a view for future development and whether or not we can afford to come, you know, buy the land back for the good of the people, for the good of the residents and future generations. Thank you very much. Um, we are coming up to the end of our first hour, and I know there was, we did think that we might extend it slightly if there remained questions. I've got an area that I think we haven't um, touched on yet, but um, Anne um, Jones thought that my pulling together all the traffic questions didn't quite get her specific one asked. So Anne, could you quickly ask that one and could I ask for brief comments because it's a topic that could expand for the next 20 minutes so <laughs> let's try and get focused answers thank you hi thank you Jenny I want the question I wanted to ask is given that there is no evidence of LTNs improving air quality what are the candidates positions on the current Fox Lane and Bow schemes and secondly whether they would introduce any new LTNs or quieter neighbourhoods and any plans for any mitigations they would try to put in place before introducing such schemes. All right, thank you, Anne. Um, I'm going to come to Ertan first on that one. Um, our, our policy is clear that we, we disagree with the LTNs in their current format. Um, they um, displace traffic they don't they haven't been shown to decrease pollution um as you know as, as i said earlier my office is based in palmer's green and the number of times there's been gridlock because of temporary lights on alderman's hill broken down buses um where you can't overtake because they've narrowed the roads already and there's just gridlock so um what the answer is 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 the tricky part um, do we just simply rip them up? I think that would be unfair on the people that live there already. Um, we do need a consultation, a proper consultation, not the fake consultations that the uh, incumbent party se seems to love. Um, a proper consultation as to what the people actually want in the area. It's not clear cut. Not everyone wants the LTNs that lives, live there. And it's usually the majority, it's usually a minority that respond to the consultation. So we need an 
in-depth proper consultations um, to find out exactly what the answer is. It may be uh, a combination of one-way streets, restricted access at certain times, prohibiting left turns, right turns, understanding how the rat runs uh, work to stop people using that, those roads as a shortcut, but opening them up. Um, All right, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Okay, moving to Rob. Uh, we make it something really simple, really complicated. If they work, they stay in. If they if they don't work, they come out. I think while there is no evidence possibly to say either way, it's because the council doesn't look for evidence. It's not solely Labour's fault. They were brought in in a rush after COVID. Uh, I'm not looking to beat anybody up over it, but look, if they have caused this amount of ructions then there is something going wrong i think there's possibly something going wrong with the political parties as well and the way that we're fostering a culture war at the moment um i found ertan's answer very impressive and very good and very out of keeping with what a lot of his <laughs> candidates are saying but yeah look I, unless you get something that is works and can be proven to work and we've got to be honest about what they are they are Traffic of evaporation does work, but it's not a magic formula. It doesn't come in overnight. Um, there's a lot of stick about this and not much carrot. But if you can show that they do work, then will they stay in? It's, it, I, I don't understand why every four years we have to have some sort of major... Last, last time it was cycle lanes, this time it's LTNs. Next time, who knows? But we seem every four years to have to have something where people want their borough back. No one's taking it away. If we want to take something away, let's take away this poisonous atmosphere. We're being ridiculous. Okay, thank you. Uh, Charith. I mean, I, I mean, the, uh, being uh, the council in the Southgate ward itself, uh, which uh, there are a few roads within my ward which falls into the Fox Lane LTN. I just ha I have a very good view on the, what residents are saying. Um, I, I think there are residents who are within the scheme who like it and a lot who don't like it as well. But the overwhelming majority of residents who live outside the scheme just do not like it. I would say 90% because I do knock on hundreds and hundreds of doors. So it's not a made up stuff, right? And I, I, I know the feedback I'm getting. So are LTNs good? Uh, this is a type of question which is just not well, that causes the debates. So you have to really get your objectives and your um, specific uh, projects defined really well. Some LTNs are good, some are bad. Um, if you take, there are some small LTNs uh, in uh, inner city London areas, which could be good. You can have this huge one like Fox Lane, which is one of the biggest, uh, which, causes difficulty and you cannot compare one LTN with another. If there's a LTN which connects the M25 to the 406, it won't work similar to some other LTN somewhere else. So as a, a general point, we have to define our objectives really well. And one of the issues why I call the LTNs into scrutiny, because the objectives are very, very poor. When they started the project, they said, uh, one of the key objectives is to reduce through traffic through the lakes estate, certainly the Fox Lane one. And if you close the roads, of course you reach the objective, that's fine. But that's not how uh, you, you should do projects. You have to understand what are the issues, the knock-on effects on the outside? What are the issues about the people with protected characteristics or on people who are on the, who rely on income on early paid workers, on carers, gardeners, cleaners, can they afford to get stuck for 20 minutes, you know, 10, 15 minutes is money in their pockets, right? So one of the reasons, uh, it, it's not a straight question, do you like LTNs or not? I'm just saying it has to be robust in its evidence and open to absolute scrutiny. We should be so transparent and not worry about changing it and admitting it, it's not working. Thank you, Charis. Uh, that's one thing which we really want to push there if I'm back in the council. Okay, I'm going to ask one question that um, hasn't come up elsewhere that's in an area in our manifesto, which is about mitigating the risk of floods. People remember we had some really strong flash floods a few weeks back, 
and you know we've got a lot of hardscaping a lot of blocked up drains that never seem to be cleared what would what would you do to help um this what could be an imminent risk of flooding for some of our communities um, hey, um Ertan, maybe you could start and we'll see what, what the issue is with yes yeah, um thank you jenny well in our manifesto we've actually identified that as a problem the the flooding so we do undertake to or pledge to implement a, a sustainable drainage, urban drainage scheme to help alleviate flooding across the borough. So that is one thing we recognise and one thing we do seek to address. That's great. Thank you. That's a clear and brief answer. Uh, Rob. Yeah, I mean, look, there's a number of things you can do. Uh, you can do uh, sort of urban sponges, this sort of thing, where um, you know, the, the urban farms, I mean, it's working with nature, not against it. Nature will do as it's going to do anyway um you can do many things to get rid of floods and uh, one of them is to um stuff like the new river we can move that along and let it out um it's not my over expertise i'm honest I, I i don't have an answer that isn't a generic one that says we have to work with nature not against it okay that's fine thank you charis can we get you unmuted yes Sorry, I, I got uh, my uh, system for, froze for a minute. Um, yes, yeah, so on, on the flooding issue, there we have certainly some areas, particularly if I look at the uh, meridian water area. Um, we did quite a lot in that um, during our meridian water environmental strategy work. There is uh, certainly some things which we have to look take very seriously because even if it's a once in a um, hundred year type flood, that can cause quite a lot of damage with the level of climate change that's going on. Um, and it, so that has to be really um, looked at in more detail. And certainly, we certainly should have more uh, ways of um, like the soak, um, like green gardens and soak away areas, right, which allows the water to go, um, um, not cause flooding. Certainly, in my own ward, when there's heavy rains, there are many areas that get uh, flooded from time to time. Um, and, but we have an added issue, which also some of the flooding that's happening because the drainage systems are very poor. Certainly we have lots of uh, uh, very localized flooding. And many of the times we get, uh, have to call in Thames water to clear up certain drainages and stuff, which are causing a lot of issues and then they block the roads up. So that's some, uh, something which we really need to address in a much more clear way. But it, some of these infrastructure issues which are causing flooding also need some serious investments to get those. Um, and right now what's happening is people are coming and patching up little bits of things and a, a few months later or a year later, the same places flood again. So we, we need to have a way of um, coming up with a longer term solution to, to really tackle that one. Okay, thank you. I've noticed there's quite a lot of comments in the chat about this from Cathy about paving over front gardens and um, banning plastic grass and bringing more wetlands in and um, bringing more natural bends to our um, rivers and brooks, all of which I, I would be enthusiastic about. Um, somebody has asked for the um, to, for us to say which parties they're from. Um, Ertan is from the Conservative Party, Rob is from the Liberal Party, and Charith is from the Green Party. And we invited the Labour Party, but they weren't able we to. We haven't been the Liberals. We haven't been oh, the Liberals sorry, for 20 Liberal, years. Oh, sorry, I beg your pardon. <laughs> they're a very different woman. party right now, I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Liberal Democrats. <laughs> Um, I'm going to take Chair's privilege and ask a question on an area of my interest, which is um, Enfield Parks. Um, they are, are, I think, one of the glories of the borough. When I was involved in a residence association, the green spaces were what everybody said they appreciated the most, along with their neighbours and community. And yet I feel they're very sadly neglected, though they often have very great uh, volunteer Group. So I'd like each of you very briefly to say what you do to Im improve Enfield Parks, um, starting with Rob. 
was caught unawares again and didn't have my unmute button. Uh, we signed the Parks Manifesto, all um, all the Enfield, um, the Liberal Democrats, uh, Enfield have, have signed that. Um, but I think over and above that, you know, the, the parks are the one thing that, that I think maybe we've lost sight of until we had COVID when everybody went, oh, wait, maybe I don't have to get in the car and go miles to find somewhere nice. Um, we've got to work with the local um, friends of insert name here park because we've always got them and they're the ones that know best. Uh, we need some community funds to give to out to those people to spend as they wish. And uh, you know, I will give uh, the council their due. They do look after the, car, the parks pretty well. I think there's an element. No, I, I think you know, if you go to town park, then they do the plants, they do the gardens, the urban parks are done pretty well. The play areas are pretty good. There are things we can add, like a lot more bins. I mean, if you go to White Webs, um, there's not many bins up there and you can have more regular um, take, you know, waste disposal. I mean, every bank holiday or sunny day, everything overflows. But I think there's also an element of personal responsibility that if the bin's full, take it home. Um, but yeah, we work with the local uh, friends of the park and we've all signed up to the manifesto and um, we ah. support it old heartedly. It's <laughs> all 58 of us. <laughs> yes, yeah, so if only everybody signed up to us, there we are. But um, Ertan. Um, like, like Rob, um, our pledge is to work with the friends of, and there are you know many, many, many good friends of parks across the borough. Um, but personally, and this is something I'll push as well, be, and I've got a, uh, my, uh, for my own vested interest, I'd like to see something happen at Broomfield Park. It's, it's just a shame it's been so long that it's been off the agenda. It seems to sort of been put on the back burner. And I'd, I'd love to see Broomfield Park back on the agenda and see something being done with that. Um, it's, it's such a shame that it's been left to rot for so long. We, we didn't get the funding when, when we applied for it. Um, but certainly, yeah, work with all the friends groups. They they know their parks. I know Broomfield and I want Broomfield Park House back. Remember it as a child and I want it back. Yeah, this has got the swans back, which is the first time in a lifetime. <laughs> um, Charith. I mean, um, I mean, everyone knows that there the, are some really fantastic parks in Enfield. Um, I'm certainly in Southgate around us, we have um, uh, quite a few green flag parks which has got the green flag ratings which is uh, the Groveland Park, Oakwood Park, Arnest Park, Broomfield Park and the Trent Park so very close uh, walking distance you have some, some fantastic parks. Uh, they, we, we can't forget the fact that all these friends of parks groups who are doing a fantastic job to um, help keep those in those areas so we, we certainly have to support those people as much as you can um, in helping to keep those um, green flag status of those of those parks, uh, we still get complaints from people about um, the, the dog foulings and a uh, lot of litter from time to time in these parks. So it, it has to be uh, a huge effort, not just from the council and the friends groups, but also from the public, because again. Uh, a level of education is needed because these are common spaces which we all enjoy and it's essential that we all look after it together um, mm. whether we organize more litter picks or uh, even the collection putting bags up for do dog fouling it spoils it for everyone when you don't have that those facilities mm. thank you charis and thank you to all the candidates for being here and spending your time with us. I say you could have been at knocking on doors, hopefully in whatever, and speaking non-politically, I hope you've all gained some votes from your contribution for your parties here today. And thank you to all the people who've taken part and the people who've put a lot of work into creating the um, NCAF manifesto. I'm looking at, at Vicky and Francis and Zoe, all of whom were very active in that. And um, to everyone who's working on these issues in whatever capacity, um, right across the borough or more widely, this is a vitally important issue for all of us. We've not got long to start, well, to heal the, our planet and we can start locally. Um, think globally, 
act locally is the old slogan that's still as true as ever. So um, we'll close the meeting now. Thank you, Francis, for holding the, uh, the fort and letting everybody in. And um, let's see what happens um, the other side of the May elections. And I'm sure we'll all be waving the flag for environmental issues and positive, strong action um, thereafter. Thank you very much. Thank mm -hmm. you.